One of the first things that Pertec did after acquiring MITS and the Altair product line back in 1977 was to discontinue production of the 8-inch drive you see over here on the right. What they did instead is go with a dual drive cabinet. Let me pan around over here. Here's a couple of examples of them. These are slightly different, the same basic thing though. Um, you can see it's available on a rack mount version. That would be what we're looking at here. Fits into a standard 19-inch industrial rack, which is frankly how Pertec ended up delivering their higher-end business systems as a in a short 30-inch rack that was part of an office desk. And of course, you could also get it with a nice cover if you wanted to mount it uh, desktop style instead. All right, so these cabinets were actually an existing product from another company called Icom. And coincidentally, Pertec purchased Icom in 1977 as well. Their goal was to get a quick entry into the microcomputer marketplace by purchasing these two companies. Um, however, they had no interest in the hobby market that had brought Altair this far. And frankly, a lot of Icom's business was the hobby market. They pulled all their full page ads that had been there since day number one in publications like Might, uh, Byte and Creative Computing and some of the others. Instead, their goal was to focus on the small business market where they hoped to sell accounting systems, uh, inventory, payroll, uh, word processing systems that would do those. And for those applications, you pretty much always had to have at least two floppy drives. So going with a two drive cabinet seemed like a pretty reasonable solution there. Also, the Altair drive was uh, not extremely reliable. It was one of the weaker points. In order to have a reliable business system, uh, they wanted to improve that reliability substantially. And that they were able to do with the move to this drive cabinet. And we'll go into more details of that a little bit later. Now, in the end, they made three different products based on these style drive cabinets that we were looking at. And we're going to look at each of those in this video and in the next two videos. In this very first video, however, we're going to look at what was called the 3202, which was the direct replacement for the Altair drives. So we'll uh, do a video cut, video cut and get that set up and come back and take a close look at the first of these products, the 3202. The 3202 was a 100% compatible drop-in replacement for two of the original Altair drives. The reason for this is because other than the power supply, the content of this cabinet was essentially the content of two of the Altair drive cabinets. Over in the computer, the um, same disc controller card set was used in the computer. That had a female DB37 on the back of the computer. So this cabinet has a male mating connector that comes in through a ribbon cable to what's called the buffer board. So let's take a look. Buffer board was used in the original cabinet as well. So it comes in from the outside world to the buffer board. The buffer board then uh, provides a buffer for input and output through this cable to the drive. You can kind of see that cable over here. It comes out of this right connector and goes to the drives connector. It also buffers signals in and out over to the next drive in the chain. And that's this ribbon cable here coming over to the input connector on the next buffer board, just like we came in. So this cable is essentially in the old drives would have gone to the outside world and in another drive. Here you can see our other drive is just sitting right next to it. And as you might expect, this connector could then go out to another one of these cabinets and get more drives if you really wanted. So if all this was so similar and identical, why was it more reliable or was it really? Well, one of the first problems that the original Altair had was an airflow problem and that let the thing overheat. Take a look at uh, the top of a Altair cabinet. Quite often, is, am I getting this low enough? There we go. You'll see them taped up like this on their vents. This is an Altair floppy drive cabinet. And they were taped up like this because the airflow would get short circuited, so to speak, without the tape. And it would never really cause air to flow over the parts that got hot. It took them a while to figure that out with a bunch of failures, but yeah. So the answer was duct tape, as you see. This new cabinet, has much better airflow. Um, the fan in the back, as you can see there, forces air in, and it has to follow this path to get over to the exhaust port. So the airflow is better, keeps temperature down, that improved reliability. The other main problem with Altair drives was their power supplies. They were in-house designed, just bare bones, the kind of things you would learn in the first chapter of a book about power supply at school. Uh, power supply is a commercial off-the-shelf supply made by a company called, I just drew a blank, I think it's Alpha Power. I have one of these out of the cabinet I'll let you take a quick look at. Here's the, um, yeah, Alpha Power AC power supplies. So this 
Trans this uh, transformer is a little rusty, but this is the power supply that's in there. Much better designed power supply. It has adjustable current limits, as you would expect on a high-end power supply. Short circuit protection. You have adjustable voltage outputs so that you can account for part variations, aging, etc. Components all had plenty of headroom in them, which quite often the Altair didn't. The thermal design uh, with the big huge heat sink and all is, is better than it was on the Altairs. So right off the bat, you've got now a much more reliable power supply that takes care of that reliability problem. The other reliability problem was actually something that couldn't be blamed on MITS. It was Pertec's own problem, and that was with the drives used in the original Altair cabinets. It was their FD400 series, and in these drive cabinets, they abandoned those and went with the 500 series. Um, as far as software and everything is concerned, they're identical. Let's take a look at them. I have two of them here. Over on the left is the FD400. The hub motor, this is what spins the disc, on the FD400s is a DC motor uh, that is run by the controller card off of 24 volts DC. It was notoriously unreliable in that it would often stall. And if it stalled for long, say 30 seconds or more, um, it would then start burning out transistors that drove the thing. And there was three of them that it took to drive that. And so it was always a problem when that failed because then you had a board that needed to be repaired. In fact, it was common enough that on some of these that I've gotten into repair, there is actually a little circuit board mod that makes the front panel LED for power flicker while the motor is spinning so that you can know your motor is still spinning or not. So in this new drive cabinet, they went with the FD500 series, which has a DC, excuse me, an AC motor to spin the hub. So this was much, much more reliable. Um, it also reduced power consumption on the 24 volt line, which made the power supply requirements cheaper. And it ran cooler on the circuit board because it didn't have the transistors and all that had to drive that DC motor. So anyway, that was a Pertex problem. They never really solved it that well. Um, but the AC motors, and you can see the, the, the motor side of those up here, instead of the hole, the other ones have a hole in that spot. So that was Pertex own problem. They went to the 500 series drive and um, that of course greatly improved that reliability. All right, the final thing that improved reliability was the fact that they finally went to um, standard ribbon cable and IDC connectors. On the original Altair, you would have had a female DB37 in the back that this ribbon cable came in on, except they hand soldered all the individual conductors to that rear DB37. And then all the wires from this were staggered in length and hand stripped and soldered to holes in the board. Same with this connector that went back to another DB37. Same with this connector that went to the drive and to the connector on the drive. In the, all, in the end, there was like 216 connections um, to be hand soldered for one drive. Um, let's see, I have the numbers written down here somewhere. So 216 connections inside the drive. That's the end of the wires that had to be stripped and soldered, many of those staggered lengths. And then uh, there's two drives, so that's 432 of those wire ends that were stripped and soldered. And then the cable on the outside, that was hand soldered too. That's another 72 connections. So you can imagine not only was that a manufacturing nightmare, but it was also a reliability problem. And it was not like MITS, unlike MITS and Altair, to essentially charge the hobbyist an hour of labor to save 10 cents on a part. And that's essentially the logic why so many things were hand soldered. It was just because, well, it's, it's a kit, let them do it. But anyway, they finally went to IDC, and of course, the reliability was better, and the manufacturability just went through the roof. Of course, that was way better and made this less expensive. Now, to Mitt's credit, they had gone to um, ribbon cables in the very last version of the original drive they were making. However, that actually never made it to market. It was canceled by Pertec because they were moving to this drive anyway. If you take a look over here inside these drive cabinets, let me see if I can get one of these open. Excuse me in the picture. This is actually one of the newer style drives that never went to market, where they finally went with IDC connectors inside the original drive cabinet. So um, they had done that to improve the, the difficulty of assembly and get rid of reliability issues of all those connections. But um, between improving airflow and the power supply and getting two drives in one cabinet and a 19 inch rack, they, they went this route instead anyway. 
All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and uh, close this up and get some, make some room here so that I can uh, bring out a terminal and we'll go ahead and boot up, um, probably see if I can get the counting system to boot up under basic so you can see how this would have worked in the day. So I'm gonna go ahead and boot Altera counting, specifically the general ledger module. Uh, again, this all runs under Altair Basic. There was no concept of using an operating system like CPM or anything like that. And that was actually a bit problematic in the end, and maybe in a whole other video we'll go into that. Um, now, typically this would have been used with an Altair Turnkey computer. I don't have one of those sitting here. I'm using just an original 8800. But I do have the Turnkey board in there, which is going to jump straight to the uh, disk boot ROM at F1000. So as soon as I turn the computer on and the drive is ready, it'll go ahead and boot. So I'll turn the drives on, turn the computer on. The computer is now running the disk boot loader, but until the drive is ready, see the ready light goes off, you'll see it take off here and there. As soon as the drive is ready, it goes ahead and now it's actually doing the boot. I'm going to insert the other disk as well. All right, so over here on the terminal, it's asking for memory size. You've seen me just hit return a hundred times on different videos. But in this case, we actually have to give it a size based on how much RAM we have and how we sysgen or configure the accounting. So I have enough RAM to save space above 59,000 in memory where the uh, basic accounting has to put some uh, assembly language routines, basically drivers for doing console I.O. The printer here does not matter uh, because the accounting system does its own printer drivers. I have disk number, I have two drives, so that's zero and one. I have to have five files at once. And at this point, we're basically just sitting in basic. No disks are mounted. You could just do what you would do in basic. Um, we're not running accounting at this point. But to do anything, you have to mount the disks. So you have to type mount. And at this point, it's going off and it's mounting the two disks, but it starts with the second disk first. You can see the light on over there on the right-hand disk. It takes about 15 seconds a piece to mount these disks. Again, not as convenient as CPM or something where it just worked. Okay, now it's on the drive zero, and it'll finish this in a minute. And once it does this, um, we're still not really running the accounting system. We just have basic up and running with the disks mounted so we can see what's on them. All right, that's done. All right, the directory command is files. And that shows us what's on drive zero. Those are all the different accounting files and, and programs. And on the second disk, I've got, well, normally I would have a, another file maybe for backing up the accounting data or maybe running actual data files on a separate disk. But we've got important stuff like games in the second disk. So again, this is just basic. You could run a program um, do that off the second disk. So all we are doing is running basic at this point. We're not actually running uh, the accounting yet. And that rocket will blast off. There we go. Okay, so now let's get some real work done. Alright, to run the general ledger, since I have the general ledger disk in here, you can just type run general ledger menu. Run is a basic command that loads a program and then turns around and executes it. All right, so you can see it's telling us now we have to initialize, so it's loading another program after it loaded the menu. Now, interestingly, the backspace is backspace for basic, but once you're running the software, it uses the delete key with the 7F as backspace. All right, and now it's gonna sit, it's gonna go back and load the general ledger program again. So a lot of these modules, a lot of these commands load another basic program with the chain command, um, and that's what takes time in between. All right, so if you're running general ledger, this is the menu option list you would get. Um, everything from entering things to copying disks, stuff like that. So let's go ahead and do the RPG with report, report program generator. And we can just do a balance sheet. Step back a little bit to see what it's doing. 
So right off the bat, you can see it's not like fast. Um, and it's not really slow just because of the disc. Okay, you can start to see the, the balance sheet coming out on the other page. And if you look, we're not disc bound. We're spending more time doing CPU work than we are disc work. Uh, again, this is the downside of running this in basic. It's asking for a date, hold on. I'll come to the terminal. You know, I don't know if you noticed there, um, so basic is doing console I.O. It's using actual basic code to read the characters from the keyboard. So it's not hard to type faster than it can accept them. So if you're a touch typist, you have to stop that and basically hunt and peck so that you don't overrun it. Buff well, it's not even a buffer, so you don't miss characters. All right, so here it's doing a general ledger balance sheet. And you can see it, it's dropping those lines out pretty slow, but it's not disk bound by any mean. It's spending more time doing computations than it is reading data from disk. Um, later on, this software that we're running became Peachtree software, which became very big on vector graphics machines, and later the IBM PC on into the Windows days. Um, even a business I own ran it in 2000, it was still running it. Um, and of course, by then it got much faster. They went to compile basic, and then later it was completely rewritten in other languages. But running it under compile basic helped a lot because again, we're not totally disbound here. Um, a lot of this is just how fast the code is running. All right, so that was uh, generating the balance sheet, which seems quite slow, but if you've been doing it by hand all along, that probably seemed quite fast. Um, now this was extremely problematic in the end. Uh, the basic program itself had bugs. Basic itself had issues, uh, mainly with string collection and things like that, and they went through a few versions of basic to try to fix that. Hardware still had problems, mainly uh, RAM was an issue. Um, and so these personal microcomputer systems still really couldn't cut, uh, do what was needed to be a professional accounting system for small business when you consider the prices. For this system that you're seeing here along with a printer um, and the software, I mean the software alone was $4,000 in 1978-ish. You were about 11,000 for this equipment and Today's dollar, that's like $44,000. So you spent over $40,000 for something that didn't really even work that well. Um, you can see why it didn't quickly catch on and why in the end there was a lot of problems for Pertech trying to keep customers happy and this whole um, plan didn't work out too well. Now eventually as computers got more and more reliable and less and less expensive, software prices also came down dramatically. And 10 years from here, um, Peachtree Software was a big name in software. This was their humble beginnings back while it was uh, still part of the Altair systems. But uh, yeah, the whole accounting system may deserve a video of its own one day. All right, so that'll do it for looking at the 3202. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the second product that was available uh, in this cabinet. It's called the 3712. It was actually a product made by ICOM before they joined Pertech and then Pertech finished up the development of that and released it as a 3712. It didn't require an Altair, it could run in a number of different computers because the controller was in the disk drive cabinet itself, not in the computer. And the computer was just a simple parallel interface and that was easy to make for different computers. And it was a soft sector controller that implemented the IBM standard, uh, the eight inch single sided single density 3740 standard. Now we'll look at that in a little bit and you'll see how complex that set of boards was to do that in discrete TTL in the days before the Western Digital chips. Uh, again, the Altair got away with this by doing it with hard sector, which a lot of the early controllers did to make it simple. But we'll go into detail on that in that video, um, but that wraps it up for looking at this replacement for the Altair drive.